So you so begin I, now, huh? I say five, four, three, two, one, then you begin. Huh? Five, four, mm. three, two, one. So very good evening to you, uh, Bishop, uh, the retired Archbishop of the Diocese of the Anglican Church of Southeast Asia, Dato Ng Munhin. Of course, I'm sure you have a doctorate too. Thank you for coming uh, to grace this uh, uh, series. We call it Giants, Generals, and Great Servants of the Lord. And mm. you happen to be the 10th or 11th, I think 10th. Welcome. <laughs> and yeah, it's so nice to see you again. Uh, I remember having lunch with you and yeah. uh, got to know you in that short period with Dr. Ron. Uh, I found you to be a very simple, humble, and approachable man of God, you know. No airs at all. Uh, as a doctor, a senior doctor, I'm trying to work on my humility to bring it lower, 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 meeker, you know? But I see that, you know, I see that in you. So wonderful. So welcome again and welcome to the guests who are present for this uh, series. Uh, uh, we have all been blessed, you know, to hear from great servants of the Lord. Uh, how you have, there's so much we can cover, but in 16 minutes, we try to get the gist of it. So I always begin to hear how you got saved, how you came to know the Lord Jesus Christ. I read about it. It's quite an amazing story. Take your time. You know, we want to hear <laughs> from the man of God how you met Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Your time now. Thank you. Uh, are you all right to hear me now? Nice okay. and clear. Yeah, it's your time. Good evening to all of you. Uh, I am uh, so privileged and so glad that uh, Doctor Timothy Singh has uh, selected me. Uh, not that I am any person, but uh, you just want to serve God. I'm going back to my uh, conversion. Uh, I was a non-Christian uh, and accepted Christ at the age of 20. So I literally don't have very much on the uh, Sunday school experience or the uh, junior youth experience. Uh, so. When a time when I came into faith, it was 20 years old and I was in university. Prior to that, uh, I was a person who uh, have always been searching. I remember uh, when I was 13 and there was, I was sitting outside my house, uh, which is a shop. Uh, then the one Indian man passed by and he said, said, Hey son, you want to know your fortune? So I, at that time, young man, young guy, curious. And he says, it's only one dollar. At that time, one dollar is a big one. And I don't know what happened. I say yes. So I, and he took up, he has a parrot with him. He has a cage and a parrot. And then he has a card, he laid the card on top, asked the parrot to come out and pick one card. And he looked at the card and looked at me, look at my palm, look at my face. Then he said quite a lot of things. Most of the things I've forgotten, except one thing. I remember one thing. And he says that you are quite a smart guy, but you can study. At the time I was 13 from one. He said you can study up to uh, from six. To, to me at that time, Form 6 is a great thing because Form 3 you have to take an exam, Form 5 you have to take an exam, and Form 6 you have to take an exam. Then he says you can reach Form 6 but you cannot enter university. I didn't bother. After all, my family, nobody has gone into university. Uh, maybe. I'm, I'm, I don't really bother because it's a long time and after it's just a fortune. You believe that it will come true. You don't believe it won't come true. I have forgotten about it, long time forgotten about it. But now I think back, when I look back, many years later I look back, actually these things have disturbed me. Since that time, I was uh, really searching for something, some purpose of life. So I was struggling in me. I tried all of the religion of my family and then we tried a lot of ways. And it's still like a roadblock. There's no, no, no passage through. 
So that's uh, the struggle that I have. And I remember then suddenly when I come to Form 5, Form 3 when I pass, well, I, I, I didn't remember this thing. When I come to Form 5, Form 5 I didn't pass. Uh, at that time, I didn't pass because of the Bahasa Malaysia. Uh, the rest of the results are quite good, but Bahasa Malaysia I didn't pass. So obviously I cannot go to Form 6. And suddenly this thought came up. This uh, fortune telling thing came up. And he says that you are not good enough. And it's the voice saying not good enough. And I was very sad and I was very unhappy. Uh, I wanted to overcome, but I don't know how to overcome. So in the end of the day, I, uh, I press on and carry on to do study. Uh, I didn't try not to be bothered by it. Then went to Form 6, again, uh, didn't work out. Uh, not that the result cannot pass. Again, the entrance exam can get through uh, one time, two times. And it had to go three times. I had to do repeat and three times. Uh, but I didn't give up. One good point, I didn't give up. So finally, one day, and I got a, a letter of admittance to university. I was so happy above the moon. And then finally, and when I registered myself in university, uh, I was really worried that uh, whether this, this fortune telling comes true or not. Uh, but it, it did. But, but the day after I registered, I got my uni card. And I say, hey, I, this guy is a bluff. I have to wait until then and say, this guy is a bluff. Um, he has sort of uh, twin, uh, bound my, my future, bound my life so much. So because of that, I was really searching to get free, get out, get free. So immediately in university, someone... Uh, after two months, someone invited me to... This is to, in Melbourne, uh, is it? Yeah, that was in Melbourne. And I was... Uh, uh, invited me to uh, uh, evangelistic rally. A big rally. Uh, I didn't know what is going on. He says, come, come, come. So, and I have nothing to do. So I just follow. And when I went there, so that night itself, uh, I was really like a bondage struggling within me. And I remember the, the, the speaker was inviting, at the end, inviting an author call, inviting to, to commit your life, to follow Jesus. So, and this, this uh, speaker was saying, uh, I want you to follow Jesus. You know, uh, just to follow Jesus. I'm not asking you to become a Christian or become anything. So, just follow Jesus. So, I like the idea because I want to break through. And one month before, someone gave me a Bible to read the first time. I said, hey, this guy, Jesus, is a very uh, different person. So I want to follow. So I decided, but that was in, it didn't mean really struggle, a lot of struggle. So after a lot of struggle, and finally, I, I stood up and I walked in front. And everybody congratulated me, say, oh, you are not a Christian. I said, no, no, I'm not a Christian. I only want to follow Jesus. He it says the same, I say not the same. <laughs> Those were the days. But uh, it was in an assembly of God church. Um, so I, I literally accepted Jesus and believed him in his, the Wonderful. assembly of God church. Wonderful. But, you, but that you church had... was so far away from me, mm, mm. from where but I stayed. Before that, uh, Bishop, you went through some very difficult times like depression. Was this before you came to Christ or after? No, that is after. Oh. Uh, I will come to that later. Yeah, come. Uh, carry on then. Uh, so, so, when I was uh, living far away, so I didn't join the Assembly of God Church. Of course, I didn't know what denomination or church and all this at that time. So, I, I just follow one of my Christian friends, go to his church. And it is a Church of Christ at that time. It's like a Baptist style, you know, similar Church of Christ. So I grew up there. So I was accepted Christ in the Anglican, uh, in the Assembly of God Church. And then I go to the Church of Christ. Uh, grew up four years uh, there. And then I came back after my studies. 
I you came back an and uh, engineer, isn't it? You became an engineer. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I did my civil engineering there. So then I came back. Uh, I, I got a job, and it is away from my hometown. Uh, so I joined the. At, at that time, I, I looked around. I saw a church, and I joined the church. It was a Methodist church. I spent some time there, help uh, go together with the cell groups and do some service there. Then I was posted again to another place uh, that, uh, that was only one church then uh, in a new place in Kelantan and it was a Pentecostal Evangelical Church. So I joined the Pentecostal Evangelical Church. I have never entered or never early ministries uh, of these years, have never uh, sort of encountered Anglicans in many sense. Huh? Uh, but then late, later I spent, God called me into the Anglican Church. That is a different part of the story. So that's the early part of the, the, the faith. And How of course my non- How did your family yeah, accept it? My non-Christian family, the whole family uh, were non-Christian. Uh, find it very difficult, of course. Uh, I had a biggest blunt, uh, well, Bombardment in the sense my parents were unhappy, family were all unhappy. But I, because, because I was far away in Melbourne. So by the time I came back, they thought I would mellow down, cool down, and would be just normal. Um, when I come back, I worked a couple of years. Then worst thing happened <laughs> because I say I want to go full time. And that is more uh, well, like an explosion coming up. A big explosion. Uh, I'm the only one who can go overseas and the only one who go to university at that time. Uh, so I mean, you say you want to uh, go into full time. This is something the non-Christian family cannot accept. Uh, How old so, were you uh, then when you had this call to go full time? How old were you then? Oh, the call was long time in Melbourne, uh, but I only responded to the call. Uh, after a couple of confirmation, um, the call by the time I went into full time is twenty six. You were twenty six years old. Well, yeah. You want to share about your call? That how you had this call? I mean, it's very powerful to hear that call that <laughs> led you to become an archbishop. So we want to hear the calling. There are a couple of calls, uh, not one call. Okay, let's 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 talk about a call. Uh, of course, the first call is to accept Jesus. And uh, there was a real big struggle, a physical experience of struggle. Uh, it was in that, uh, in that uh, church, the space of that church. Um, but then, uh, after a couple of years, when I was still in university before I graduated, uh, there was a call uh, to go full time. Prior to that, all the time, when the word says the harvest is plentiful, the workers are few, I always say it's not speaking to me, it's speaking to someone that next door, not to me. Yeah. But then one day... Were you married then? No, 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 no. I, 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 I finished, my, I finished my, my seminary yeah. studies, then I only married. Yeah. So uh, then I, I, when I one came, day. yeah, that, uh, that day when a, a call came, it was a time... Uh, I guess it was, uh, I was in the leadership of the uh, graduate, uh, the Overseas Christian Fellowship. Uh, I was uh, one of the leadership there. And I found it, uh, leadership, you know, that you have human, human um, disagreement and conflict a little bit. And then there's studies in front of you. And you have people, you are looking after some cell groups. And there are people below you. So there are a lot of demands. And then parents didn't, money didn't come on time, and it was delay. Uh, so there was a lot of stress, fear, phobia, worry, challenges, everything crammed together. Crammed so much together, it was a few months there was a struggle. Uh, I was asking myself, if I'm a Christian, I pray to God, He should have answered me, but how come all these prayers didn't answer? Or didn't answer, and and I go go around and ask church leaders and uh, Christian fellowship leaders and ask them how how to how to deal with situation. Everybody say trust God, trust God. 
until so much the word trust God, I get I hated the word and I say don't tell me. You know, don't tell me I'm not trusting God. So I, I was so taken up and I angry with that. So in the end of the day, it was the answer that, that one day I was, uh, I remember in uh, 1977, it was uh, in August, I went to a library and October is our exam. And in the library, I was trying to study uh, because my mind was so confused and so many things going up and down. Uh, I couldn't study for a few months, couldn't concentrate. Then I, 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 I have a habit. Before I start anything, and I was a young Christian, people t- taught me, before you open your book, before you do anything, you pray. So I have a habit to pray. So I encourage everybody to do that. Before you start anything, you just pray, pray and God help you. Help you. So I pray. I close my eyes and pray. The books are, uh, are open, but I didn't look at the books. I want to study, but these things so confused comes out, and finally, and I was, it was I was I can say I was in the lowest time, but it was that that I can uh, even walk fast. It doesn't even want to run, or you know doesn't want to eat. That sort of situation. So finally, and when I close my eyes to pray, and I say, God, please help me, and I I I felt something come along. And says that you have not trust me. So I, uh, you know, in my prayer there was a struggle. Then I heard a voice, a little little man voice, about uh, two meters behind me, speaking and say, "My son, uh, you are not your own. I bought you with my blood, with a price." Uh, I didn't know that it comes from Second Corinthians, so I. Uh, no, I, it is repeated twice. After repeating, uh, I did, I, I, I dare not turn back. I knew there was nobody because I went to the corner. There was nobody behind that. Uh, I didn't look back uh, at that time, but I suddenly felt that my feet was warm. Up to my, slowly, the warm come up until my head. It's like a big stone split open, you know, and, and there was no weight or burden over me. So I closed all my books, I put my books in my bags, and I turned around, nobody around, and I, at that time I can run. I dash and find one good friend and talk to him, tell him. And this person was shocked. Oh, you know, I didn't see you having this problem. Uh, so we pray, and that is the beginning. And that was a Wednesday, and a Sunday I went to church, and there was no altar call, but I went out myself at the end of the service and knew before the front and the pastor was you know was I think bubbly over over bubbly joy because no auto call also got people come out. <laughs> <laughs> so I said and then he took me aside and he, he counseled me and prayed for me. Uh, that was the beginning. I didn't know where to go, but I was beginning to say God, you know, I all the people have said trust God, that's correct which I did not. I trust basically my knowledge, my own feeling, my own skill, my own uh, imagination and my own thinking. That's the, the first call, a struggle. And a couple of other calls into ministry, uh, similar manner, but on different aspect. It's a lot to challenge my head, my brain, because we, a lot of time we are uh, cognitive people who learn knowledge and acquire skill. So for engineers like me, uh, we, we, we operate a lot in the head. God is actually knocking my head and say, you know, yes, things are good, but you have one thing, you lack one thing that is your heart. You have not allowed that belief comes into your heart. So that was a challenge. He said, can you trust me? So I trusted him because he bought me with a price, with his blood. Uh, so I trusted him. So that's the, the first challenge. Well, after ministry, and in, when I started ministry and went into church, uh, pastoring a church, uh, again, similar thing happened. Yeah. The similar thing is because you, you know, if you ask me about the low season, 
uh, I would say it is because of loneliness. A lot of leaders are very lonely. And I experienced that. I thought, you know, with all my learning, with all my knowledge, with all my training in the seminary, I can do great things. But after a while, uh, I, 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 I ran out of steam, you know, because it was lonely. And you also have the pride, no one to ask others, and you can't, don't know where. So that was, an, uh, again, another time God knocked me down very badly. And after I had to trust him again, this time I trust him again, and God supplied uh, a spiritual partner or a mentor. or we, Some people call it spiritual director, some call it spiritual partner, some people call it a spiritual friend. And it was a, a very good friend. So until today, uh, that friend, we, that is the one to help me to do the accountability and check my spiritual temperature, check my, my, my journey, and check a lot of things. We, 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 we check. Uh, the person is not Malaysian, it's overseas. So God supply a person that somehow we take in many ways, he is 10 years my senior, and we, we click, and he's also a, a, a pastor. We click very well, and so uh, we met up many times. Uh, sometimes he comes, and sometimes I go those years. Uh, now both of us are retired, uh, and that will really help me to walk through the journey, because otherwise, as uh, spiritual leaders, we can dry off. Uh, or we have no accountability, we can tension off. Because sometimes we just rest so much heavily just upon the expectation and, and achievements. And that will bring us down. As, as the Archbishop of the Diocese of Southeast Asia, how many bishops mm. did you look after? Or how many uh, ministers did you look after? There must be hundreds. Uh, yeah, the shepherd, but... Uh, you are the shepherd of the shepherds. Uh, it, it, it's, it's a slightly different notion and I try to explain. Uh, when I'm a pastor, I look after one congregation. Okay, Maybe the congregation, there will be two services or three services or five congregations, never mind, I'm one pastor. So when I am a bishop, uh, I actually don't have a lot of grassroots. The bishop is the pastor of pastor. So he pastor all the pastors. You know, he plans and chart the the direction for the pastor. Now, when you become an archbishop, uh, you you only uh, sort of share with your colleague bishop, the college of bishop, the fellow bishops, and you work with the fellow bishops. Of course, you you are still a, a bishop of the diocese. You still have your own role, but then you are archbishop. Mostly, you are more like a coordinator, a chief. Bishop in a sense, but then you do a lot of representation to the international scene. We'll the Anglicans have mm. 42 mm. Archbishops, so I'm one of the 42 in the world. Wonderful. My question actually is that since you realize the value of being mentored as a bishop, would you be actually mentoring all the ministers or only when they come to you or when you feel like men you're directed to mentor them? How many can uh, you mentor in that sense? Yeah, in, in, in theory, a bishop is supposed to be a spiritual leader and director or mentor for his priests, his pastors. In theory, in theory. But in practice, uh, it doesn't happen. Can they come and see you anytime? Can they just walk through your door anytime without appointment? Yes, yes. Uh, usually, they, yeah, you, a lot of time I make sure that there is uh you, you you can come without appointment but you just have to wait for for a little while when the, when meetings is over then you can meet, we'll see you yeah. so in theory it works but in practice it doesn't work because number one, <laughs> one of them practice because uh, they obviously don't want to let you know too many things uh, because you are his boss in a yeah. sense <laughs> so they don't want so i will always in our ordination ask them to find someone very comfortable to them mm. it can be in the country it can be outside the country at least they can meet at least once a month mm. or more you know uh, they must be comfortable with that person then they can open up 
if they are not comfortable, no point. It, it won't open up. Mm. Maybe at this point, I'll ask you, how do you rehabilitate the fallen minister? I won't say completely fallen, but you know, some problems, let's say marital problems or near divorce or going to be divorced. How do you rehabilitate that minister? Yeah, that uh, it, it, it goes case by case. Uh, I think one of the things that the Christian church must learn, uh, which I have observed over these 30, 40 years in the ministry, uh, most of the Christian church in the world have not learned uh, because we don't give people second chance. Mm. So the world is getting worse and worse. A lot of family breaks up, a lot of problem in the families. So a lot of people end up with problems. They bring the problem into church and into Christ. Uh, we need to give them second chance and, and operate that way. Mm. Uh, but That's true. one of the biggest problems is that we don't give people second chance. Mm. So you just cut them off. So they, they, there's no way to rehabilitate this person. Yeah. And the person don't want to come back. Maybe we should try like the Ministry of Education or transfer the teacher to another place. So he goes to the uh, place and functions separately. No, not necessary. It's just a thought, not necessary. Yeah, the, the church in the early years tried to do those things, but then they'll transfer the problem as well. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I want to come back to the Anglican Church Ministry, one of the earliest Protestant churches, and we really appreciate whatever our denomination, we want to thank God for this Anglican ministry that has gone on for hundreds of years. How did you get drawn to become into the Anglican Church? Yeah, I told you that I, I was not even any near anything uh, of the Anglican Church. Uh, the first uh, time that I entered into the Anglican Church, uh, it was because of my sister, uh, who was the second person to become a Christian. When I was in overseas, she was here locally, and she uh, was in an Anglican Church. So she is the one who brought me to the Anglican Church. So when I came back, I just follow her going to the church that she she, she goes uh, and I went to that church but my heart was still not comfortable with the church because I thought Anglican you know to us was really like a Catholic style so I want more to be like in the prayer Baptist you know congregational style which I grew up that, that way so but I, my, my sister and I, I want to follow her go with her and the same thing uh, I don't want to. Sh I don't want to show my family two Christian going to two different church. That's so I, I went along with her, and also thirdly that I, I'm an elder brother, so I I, I provide transport. Mm. So that that's where yes. I I finally end up in the Anglican church. And it's been forty years. Huh? Before we talk of unity, I just want to say that at what point do you feel that you're going to be a bishop? I mean, of course, once you're a bishop, then the archbishop will come on it. At what point do you think? Uh, Any... Someone seen to you or something in your heart? <laughs> you know? Yeah. But uh, uh, when you, when I remember when I was in the ministry, I was in Ipoh. Uh, I, I was here a long time, 20 years in one church. Uh, three times I'm due to transfer, but uh, it didn't work out. So I, I still stay here. So when I stay here, I carry on. I'm very comfortable with the grassroots, with the ministry, with the That's mission. St. Peter's Epoch. Yes, yes. So I expanded the church, expanded the ministry, do the village ministry, do the grassroots ministry, do the church uh, planting and all those things I did. I was comfortable. So number one, I didn't like to move out of, of this, this comfort. And number two, I, I know that anywhere I go, I have to restart anew. I was reluctant. And number three, I, I don't like politics or church politics. So I say, I told the bishop early, early years, I said, anything uh, you, 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 you can find others to go to do anything, don't, don't find me. I leave me alone in Ipoh and you, you, you find others. So I, I was not really exposed to inter-church or anything else outside Ipoh, outside Para. I was not in, in. So, but of course, I, I sense that is, uh, you know, looking at uh, the book, I sense that one day I may be uh, asked to be one. Wonderful. So, but then 
I prayed. I remember the time that I did pray and I talked to my my uh, my spiritual friend partner. Uh, no, I say I I sense something. I may be called to do a a different role, uh, but I, how do we discern from God? And the person says, you know, the person led me to another person. He led me to another person and said, hey, look at it. Uh, this person was a former Archbishop of West Africa. Then I met him and it was in England at that time. I met this Archbishop of West Africa and long story cut short, he told me, my son, on the day that you responded to God say, God say, you know, go, you say, here am I, send me. Did you think of anywhere? If God would have sent you to Africa, would you have gone? Or if God would send you to Timbuktu, would you have gone? You know, why after, at that time, after 20 years, why after 20 years, you are still asking God, struggling God, I don't want to be this, I don't want to be that. So he says that on the day God called you, you go like Abraham, just go. Amen. So his word came to me and I say, you shouldn't, shouldn't say anything. Uh, even though I, people ask me for my opinion, I say, I prefer not to. I prefer not. I don't want all this difficulty. So I, I, I settled in my heart and say, okay, you know, I, then I spoke to God. I told God, God, if you really want me to take up a role, like any, any role, you, you have to confirm and impress on me. And I remember during the election day of the bishop, I remember very clearly, just before the election, we were, the whole House of Senate was asked to pray for 10 minutes on your own, 10, 15 minutes, quiet. And I remember uh, God spoke to me very clearly saying that, my son, you have walked with me. Are you still following me? Do you still want to follow me? Uh, and I remember I broke down in tears, very, and the tears just flew down, flew down. And by the time I went to cast my word, it was tears of flowing down because, you, feel it. you know, yeah, you, you know, do you still want to walk with me? So that's, that's the journey. And at the end of the day, I mean, my name got, came up and I, and I got selected uh, to be the bishop. Wait, what year was that? I Oh, the election was in 2006. Okay, 2006. So yeah. among the bishops, eh, whether living or who have passed on, any particular bishop sort of, you know, have been uh, something close to you, Malaysian bishop, anyone that you want to mention something about him? Each one has, has their own, each one has their own strength. Who has touched yeah. you, I mean, who has touched yeah. you. Each one has their own strength and each one has uh, the the strength of the different aspects of it. That's you know? the beauty uh, of it, huh? the beauty yeah. of a leader. Mm. But I think uh, I will want to say uh, one of the greatest strength that I will uh, attracted to is the integrity. The integrity of the person. You know, the accountability of the person. We, 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 we have strength and weaknesses, but then in the end of the day, it was the integrity that bring us along the journey. You know, we, we fall, we pick it up, we fall, we pick it up, you know, we make mistakes, we say sorry, and then we go on. But the integrity is there to take us on. Uh, that, I think that one we can see in the bishops, in all the bishops that are here. Wonderful. So at this point, maybe you can give a few words of advice because bishops, you know, as the word says, one wife, and perfect, non into alcohol. What maybe in a few sentences advice you can give to all of us you know, how to be like a bishop in our life, even though we are not a bishop, how to live a life <laughs> like a bishop in a few sentences. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Apart from not pressing that button that lets you go into the dark unseen <laughs> of the internet. Don't press that button. <laughs> yeah, I think... Uh, all of us are vulnerable people. Uh, every one of us, whether you are high rank or low rank or you are name, no name, we are vulnerable people. But the only one thing is that we only have Jesus with us. Amen. So when we have Jesus with us, 
the best thing is that you know always ask the question uh, where is Jesus what will he do you know? so sometimes we forget so that's why a spiritual partner a spiritual friend a spiritual mentor is very important to check on each other how have you been and my spiritual partner very good he when I wrote to him anything uh, early days when I wrote those days was a letter and then become email so I wrote to him uh, he immediately detect I sense you are struggling mm. you know so mm. we, we, we must able to come to this one so in that sense mm. uh, we in all our struggles we don't let our struggle pull us down mm. that is important whether you have uh, you you, you 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 have you have one ministry one wife or whatever that the, it was a struggle it can be family struggle it can be ministry struggle it mm. can be a relationship struggle we it will pull us down it says always you know get into your spiritual partner before a decision is made mm. ask the spiritual partner to help you to discern so your advice that each one of us must have a spiritual partner yes very important accountability is most important in is a ministry reverend, mm, is it reverend jim dainty the one you're referring to oh you know everything <laughs> eh? uh yes 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 yeah okay yeah. tell us about your wife because she's beside you your datin yeah yeah tell us something you know her role i'm sure she holds the pillar she supports the family tell us something before we talk about the anglican contribution <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh, she's a fantastic lady i want to say uh you you will, you will, I won't want to change exchange anything for her. It's a it's a it's a wonderful, and I I I pray to God to give me somebody, and let me through. Uh, God sent her to me. Mm. Uh, she come from Kelantan, and I was working there. So we met, and then finally, uh, we come along, and she's a number one, a great supporter. Mm. She is somebody uh, who always believe. Uh, you know, in her husband, mm -hmm. and she will teach her children, mm -hmm. and you know, she will not say anything negative about the husband to the children. She will not, and she will always help the children to have a respect of the father. Mm -hmm. That that's one. Secondly, she is a person who is a very positive person. She always look at the positive side of people, not the negative side. Uh, so that that I give her really really good credit, very very good credit, and it is because she she always stood by me, and she is the best critic. After the sermon, she's the best critic. She will not simply critic, and she will only pin up pin point one or two things. Hey, hey this these things you may not you should not be saying these things, uh, or you you uh, this is good. You may say these things. Uh, very best critic. So you you have a. Uh, a parishioner in the house <laughs> who is a critic <laughs> <laughs> then then you have a partner you know in family in relationship in ministry tribute and she, uh, that in one, is it? yes uh, one tribute thing she very, very she's very good is uh, mm. she support both will support our ministry you see when i always tell her that we share with the ministry has a vacancy or lack of something and she will go into that so when there was a lack of Sunday school, she will go to the Sunday school and a teacher and a lack of women, she will go to women, a lack of worship, she will go to the worship, you know, lack of counseling, she will go to counseling. And everywhere she goes in and then we say that we will not stay too long and you prepare people to come in and then you move to the next level. Uh, so we have been moving ministry the, that way. Uh, she, she's very good. It's very clear a bishop must manage the family well must also be a good manager yeah that's fantastic uh, yeah it, something it, yeah okay you can say something about being a good manager uh, yeah the word must is uh, very daunting la. sometimes the word very hard no no you you have to be willing la. and you say must that means it somehow it's like a, a pressure come yeah. upon you i think we, it would be good to say that it should be willing to be a good manager, willing, mm. you know, to do this thing. So we then we are learning. Fantastic. <laughs> we'll, we'll hear more words of wisdom from you. But right now, can you tell us the tremendous contribution the Anglican Church has done throughout the whole world? 
uh, maybe just a gist of it, you know, like education, uh, charity, even during the times of war and all that. But focusing on Malaya, Malaysia. Oh, remind, uh, us, remind us again. Yeah, yeah true. The, the, the English missionary or the missionary for the Anglicans has come uh, together with the flag of the a British flag. When the when British came here in 1786 to Penang, so they brought along chaplains to help them. Or initially was to help them, to help the whites. You know, but there are some priests who are who, who, who passionate in the heart. They want to reach out to the locals. Uh, but they are paid by the East India Company. Say they are not supposed to do that, but they're still secretly there doing that. But then, uh, I will say three, three major things that the British uh, missionaries have brought. Not necessarily the East India Company people, but it's the British missionaries. They brought three things. They brought schools, education, they brought medical uh, ministry, uh, clinics and hospitals, and they brought uh, social ministry. Uh, those days, a lot of poor, a lot of orphans, and a lot of things during the war and things like that. So they brought these three major things. And it was these three major things that, that developed the early part of the ministry of the nation. And also, that's why we have a lot of mission schools. Uh, the, the, the largest number of mission schools are the Catholics, second largest are the Methodists, and Anglicans, the third uh, in the line. The Nang Free School was uh, the first, isn't it? Yeah, Anglican. Yes. The Nang Free School is already past 200 years. And it was the first. Uh, school, uh, missionary school and the Anglican school. It was started next to St. George's Church, where today the Hutching School. So later on, when they found a place in uh, the, the, the Island Grace area, uh, so they moved out. And then the school uh, that they were housing later on become Hutching School. So the Penang Free School, St. George's Girls School and Hutchins Schools are all Anglican schools but by our Anglican people uh, pump in the money and all these things. But after a couple of years, some, some many decades, the government, the straight governments uh, took over because they want to show to the British Parliament that they have responsibility of these schools. So after once they take over, the straight government later on become Malay government, it now become government school. Other, other schools they didn't take, but these three main schools they took. Fantastic. Can you tell us about your pet project, the Anglican Village Ministry? Yeah, I think that is a, a challenge. Uh, it's a call. So you see, when you walk with God, when you trust God, God say, now you trust me, you walk five steps. You know, can you walk another five steps? Trust me. Can you walk another five steps? Trust me. So in that sense, you know, you can, Keep walking. I still remember, uh, I, I told you that one of the, the, the leadership is very lonely in many sense. A lot of time when you want, you see something, you want to do something and the people are not following. So sometimes you get uh, agitated or you get restless or you get impatient. And that expectation didn't come. So you get yourself down. I remember uh, God, uh, one day, I remember was during my devotion, one day God told me, uh, very clear, it's just a thought that comes. I, I did my, my uh, thesis, my master thesis on the villages, Chinese villages. Then I went to India one time and I visited a lot of these uh, slums in India. Then I also organized a mission trip to uh, East Malaysia into the interior to see the interior. And one day God was telling me, he said that, hey, I didn't let you have all this experience uh, to go into the waste. I want you to put all these things in. It would shock me, you know. So my village experience in my thesis, my uh, slums, uh, in the Indian experience, and then uh, the interior of the, uh, the natives, interior in the East Malaysia. Then it came together. Somehow I, it was burdening me and challenging me. So I wrote down a piece of uh, a, a paper or a proposal paper and I submit to the bishop and submit to the authorities of church 
Uh, everybody sat on it, don't know what to do because I also put a amount, you know, I, I put what I'm, my plan I can do. It, it, it didn't materialize, it didn't work. It took a long time, so I was very depressed. I thought nobody wanted to pick up all these things. And finally, it, it, it picked up, then in 1993, it began the village ministry. Uh, I have no experience, no books, no money, no people, uh, no machinery, no methodology, but only with God's call, just go. Just like Abraham, just go. So uh, I went into the villages, go to the coffee shop, hear them, talk and see what are the needs, everything. Just move around, first to the Chinese villages, then lay on to the Asli, and then also to the estates. So we, we, that's how it all went on to begin. And of course now, it's already 25 years plus. Uh, the Chinese ministry is now uh, 1993 until now, uh, 28 years already now. Two more years, it will be 30 years. So but at that time, I planned for 30 years only. I planned 30 years so that they should be doing things by themselves, able to on their own. Really fantastic because uh, in KL, maybe Penang, Ipoh, we almost have everything, you know. But when you go to villages, there's no a Christian bookshop. You know, no, no. the percentage is so low. They can be lonely too, I think. That's the thing. They need encouragement and support. We should send out our church members in the city out to the villages. Every weekend, send 10% out just to visit. Yeah. I, I think that would be great, great you know. Praise God. But it's a, it, it's, it's a very challenging task because I remember telling one person that uh, I'm doing the Orang Asli ministry, the village ministry, People say, you are, are you crazy? You know, that, that is a bottomless pit. <laughs> bottomless pit. You know, you, you drop something, you will have no sound. You, you know, you keep yeah. feeling, you keep feeling. Uh, yeah. I, I'm like uh, Bishop <laughs> mm, uh, We have a love for Oran Asli. I served with them for a while. So if you're interested, this is a, a story, that, uh, a partial autobiography of our Bishop. From village to village, yeah. <laughs> okay, um, we still have some time. And is there anything to tell us about your challenges and your highest moment, things like that, your personal life? You know, of course, being Archbishop would be one of the highest moments. But anything yeah. you want to share with us, and also yeah. share with us your friendship with the bishops in the world. I, I hear and I know that you're a very likable person. Maybe you can also share how to be a friend you know everybody wants friend but most people have very few friends but i think many of us don't make that effort to become a good friend so perhaps you can share things like that okay thank you very much uh, let me say about the high moments uh, i will usually not refer any achievement as high moments uh, because uh, it is completely out of god i i will only want to say if the high moment is that I asked this one question to myself and I asked the same question to everybody. Uh, after you, what's next? After you, what's next? And that is where the discipleship must be there. That is, very, that is my high moment in the sense that if all that I have learned, I can pass this down to my disciple or someone who can take on and follow Jesus and carry on and do even greater work than me. Uh, I think that will be the high moment. So I think my high moment is, uh, you know, is that I want to see uh, the people whom I shepherd and especially my own family, that uh, they can carry on in Jesus, not only just carry on Jesus, if they can pick up and also serve God. That will be my high moment. So now my youngest daughter, uh, Charlotte, is, uh, is already gone into the full time. She graduated and come back. And then she gone into full time, and together with her husband, uh, went into full time ministry. Uh, of course, doesn't mean that those who are not in the full time ministry uh, are, are not children of God. No, 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 no. Just don't leave God, but do your part in your uh, full time, or in your part time, or in your uh, career, and always put God there. And then shepherd the people and drag, brought, bring people back. That will be the high moment. And you, you just imagine those, the, you know, you can say, God, you know, 
you know, like Moses saying, you know, I have Joshua, I pass everything to Joshua. You know, or Paul say, I pass everything to Timothy, you carry on the job. Uh, Jesus said, I have my disciple left. You, you go, go, you make your disciple I, and go back to heaven. So in a sense, that's the, the high movement. Because a lot of people uh, know how to do, get great achievement by themselves, but they don't know how to train others to get great achievements. So that that is important, you know. Is uh, like you say, you want to be make friends in the world, make friends mm. with them, many people. You know, the making friends number one, I think, is a willingness of heart. Mm. You are you willing to make friends? Once you make friends, in the sense that you are sharing with the person. Mm. Sharing means there are there are disagreement, mm. but you also have to share. There are agreements you also have to share. You know, sharing means you put unity, you put peace above other things first. You know, sometimes we are the people well, who want so much achievement, so much my way of doing that we don't share peace anymore. And so you lose all your friends because you don't share peace. Mm. But I'm not saying to reduce your, your level. Uh, I'm not saying you compromise. But what I'm saying that, you know, in order to win a person, in order to allow the person to see your point, you make friends first. Mm. Then the person can, then you can have a chance to talk. Then you have a chance to share. Then you have the time to convince. Mm. That is why Jesus says, you know, I want you to do evangelism. But what is the best evangelism? Is friendship evangelism. That you, know, you make friends, you know, we know intention of any kind, no motive, mm. you, are just, you are, want to be a friend. Until one day you will ask me, hey, how come you are like that? How come you are like that? You are not different from here, not different from here. So in a sense, uh, so you, you, you have to prioritize your own thing. If you prioritize achievement, success first, then you probably won't reach the friendship. You must prioritize friendship, then success mm. will come maybe a little bit later, not, not now. Sometimes you, you know, just, just to win them and you're, you're, you, in the end of the day, you will not be the only person who gets success. Maybe the whole group come together to have the success together. Maybe friendship is so important and neglected. I think we really <laughs> will come to, we'll, I'll summarize it. But at this moment, I'm still thinking, what are your thoughts of unity of the church? You know, you, you've reached up that high position. How do we stretch out to unite the church, all the denominations, as one body in Christ? Uh, we'll, we'll, yeah, you, we, will, you, we will get there, but how? <laughs> unity has been mentioned many times in the church, in the Bible, many, many times. But somehow, uh, until 2000 years later, we are still talking about the same unity. We are still talking about working together. Paul talk about it, you know, mm. Peter talk about it, James talk about it, but we're still working on it. Uh, that in, one of the things is that the very strange thing is that we have the same Lord, Jesus mm. Christ. Mm. <laughs> same mm. Lord, Jesus Christ. We have the same faith, mm. you know. But then when we come to we our own interpretation, mm. you know, you may have doctrinal differences, theological differences, methodological differences, you know, style of working differences, perception differences, expectation differences. Now you ask, which one go first? Mm. So the problem is that we cannot get unity is because we insist that our theology, our, uh, our doctrines, our relationship or our style of working methodology, we, we are thinking those things above, more important above anything else. But if we can, let, let me say one thing. Uh, when I was in the uh, CFM, Christian Federation of Malaysia, as a, a chairman, uh, we always work together with other religions called the MCCBCHST, Majlis, uh, uh, of uh, the Council of uh, uh, Buddhism, Christianity, Hinduism, uh, mm. Sikhism, Taoism, you know. Uh, mm. So we have all this whole group of people. How can we sit together? We have different gods, different theology, different faith, different things. Mm. Well, we, we, we sit together, we put together the common common things. What are the common things that we want? If we, we want to talk about a common thing, we put that common thing, but we are not saying that 
you are compromising your stand. You can believe your God, you can believe your theology, you can believe your methodology, but when we come together, we put a common thing, let's talk about a common thing, and see how much, how many common things that we can together. And so for us, our common com, commonality, uh, citizens of Malaysia, commonality that we must have the right, commonality is that we, we want to engage together, and we want to work together and friends, you know. So the, mm. we, we, if a church can do that, Mm. Are, are there no com common grounds that the church has, the denominations has? There will be a lot of common ground. Let's the non the non common ground, the theology or expression. I let's, let's I'm not asking you to drop that. But just mm. we don't talk that first. Don't put mm. that as a first page. You know, put that in the middle page. Then we will go to the first page to common thing. If we can work on a common thing, sometime when you come to, mm. you can drink coffee, you can drink mm. tea, you can eat together, we can talk together, we can go out together, and we can laugh together. That will be the strength. And then we from there, we move to the next level of common, next level of common, the less common, less common, mm. we will visit it when we come to that point. Mm. But and me in the marketplace too, I interact with all denominations and in fact I am speaking to one Catholic father who may want to come uh, to be interviewed too. So uh, we're coming to the end. Uh, it's really been tremendous. Uh, 60 minutes can't cover everything about your life. <laughs> but I want to take a, a few points that you mentioned. The need to have a spiritual brother. I think that's so mm. important and uh, fellowship with one another to the point that we know each other, we walk together. That's fantastic. Secondly, um, the need to pass the bat baton, as you said, no? uh, where where will it be You know, after we're gone? The need to pass on. It's not about us, but about the kingdom that the Lord has passed on yes. to us for us to carry on. That's the second thing. And the friendship part is, you know, stretching out your hand to know the person. The commonality and without having to judge or criticize it's not about us coming down to whatever level i mean the king the son of god came down to be our level so we there should be no issue for us we are all just worms and dust uh, thank you uh, archbishop uh, you we still need you to say a few words of wisdom to close with a prayer to bless us uh, all those who are present, and I, I always get this opportunity. Any man of God comes into my clinic, I say, please pray for me. So we can <laughs> close with that. Uh, really, thank you for coming. Uh, appreciate your humility, your love for the people of God, love for your nation. I can see your love for the nation. And you have been up there in the top, and you can look down and see what's happening on the ground, right down to the village. That's tremendous now. So thank you for coming and please now pray for all of us who are going to listen live or, you know, after that, there'll be thousands of views. And I pray that not just every Anglican, but every Christian tune in to listen to your words of wisdom. So a few words of wisdom and then please yeah. pray for us. Yeah. I always ask myself, what would Jesus want to see? Now, when Jesus uh, came to earth and he selected his 12 disciples, uh, I don't think he is very comfortable with every one of them. Uh, so, but then yet Jesus made them comfortable with him. Mm. So that is the first point. You know, and Jesus sent them out always two by two. Mm. Jesus never say go alone. Always get a partner, a friend, mm. you know, of the same vision, same way, same plan, things that they mm. go on. And Jesus always asked them make disciples. So all the th things that I didn't develop, it is all in the Bible, is what Jesus wants us. You know, get your partner, friend, you know, make your disciple, and always he says that, you know, even though you don't have to agree, Jesus didn't agree with Peter or John and everybody, everything. But he put on the commonality, let's look at the vision, move together as a common vision and common goal, and serve the king of kings and serve the people. So if we adopt these things, I think we can go a long way. Wonderful. Please pray for us. <laughs> Let's pray. Archbishop. Okay. Let's pray. Let's pray. God Almighty, you are the creator of the whole universe, but yet you are interested in the minute human being like you us here. 
and you have sent your son Jesus to be this vulnerable, minute human being. So allow us to know him, to allow us to appreciate him. Yes, he is without sin and he is the powerful one, but he can be lowering down himself so much even to die on the cross as a human being. We give thanks and praise that Lord help us learn from our Lord Jesus. Learn from our Lord Jesus that our priority is to serve God, our priority is to serve men. And our priority is not to create enemies, but make friends. And our priority is not to do things alone, but find a partner. Our priority is not to enjoy all the salvation and the benefit for ourselves, but is to make other people enjoy the same. To make disciples and make more disciples that they will also become disciple makers. Thank you, Lord, for calling us. Thank you, Lord, for working with us. Thank you, Lord, for watching over us. We commend ourselves that we still have the journey ahead of us, but we ask the Lord, let us be able to see you clearer each day, walk with you nearer each day, and following you better each day. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you and the good Lord bless you and your family and your children and your grandchildren and grandchildren's children. And Thank you. We look really forward great. to your next book more, more, more <laughs> than just the village. Uh, your story, your life, it's, you have been a blessing to thousands upon thousands and may the Lord grant you good health and be, even as your soul prospers and may everything you do prosper. Thank you, Archbishop. Thank you. you Thank you. God bless. Huh? See Thank you. Bye-bye. I end uh, the video. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.